so we can start on this lecture on the anatomy of the limbs. As I'd mentioned earlier on, this is still in the spirit of talking about musculoskeletal system, except that now we're approaching this from a topographic aspect as opposed to from a systemic aspect. You remember we agreed that uh, our lectures will be largely from a systemic approach, but when appropriate time comes, we will talk about a regional anatomy of different parts of the body. So once we've talked about the musculoskeletal system, this is the best time to then talk about the regional anatomy of the limbs or the topographic anatomy of the limbs. And so we're going to talk about the anatomy of the upper limb as well as the anatomy of the lower limb. We will start with anatomy of the lower limb, but before that, let me say a few things in general. When we want to talk about anatomy of the limbs, we were going to focus on the following. So we are going to look at the segments of both the upper limb as well as the lower limb. You are going to look at the bones and the joints of the upper and lower limb. We're going to talk about the muscle groups which are in the upper limb, the muscle groups which are in the lower limb. We will talk about anatomical spaces in each of those two limbs. We will talk about the arterial tree. And tailored to that, we'll talk about the venous drainage of the limbs. We will then talk about the major nerves which are in these limbs. We are not likely to finish all the nerves just the big ones. And lastly, we will talk about clinical anatomy. Now, what I mean by clinical anatomy or the term clinical relevance is, uh, we can look at it in two aspects. One of them is how can we use the anatomy we've learned to explain some clinical conditions that we know. So that's one way. How do we use the anatomy that we've learned to explain some clinical condition that we know? But two is how do we use the anatomy that we've learned to intervene clinically? How do we apply that anatomy in a clinical practice? So that is what I mean by clinical anatomy. And we'll be highlighting on that from maybe an example point of view to make it clearer. So as I told you, we are going to start with anatomy of the lower limb. After that, we look at anatomy of the upper limbs. So let's begin with the segments of the lower limb. The lower limb has a number of segments. This is a gluteal region, what you call the buttocks. This is the thigh. This is the leg. And the one down there is the foot. Those are the lower limb segments. There are those four. How about bones of the lower limb? We talked about them some time back. We agreed that the bone in the pelvic region is this one here, which we call the pelvic girdle, or the pelvic bone. Now, the bone labeled A is what we called ilium. The bone labeled B is what we call pubis. And the bone labeled C is what we called ischium. So this is ilium, pubis, and ischium. 
and I want to ask you people a question. So what do you call this one? The one labeled X, what do you call it? Anyone? The pubic symphysis. Very good, that's the pubic symphysis. There's another joint. So the pubic symphysis is the joint between the right and the left pubic bone. Then there's this region labeled Y, this socket, which is here. Anyone, what do you call that socket? Acetabulum. Very good. The acetabulum is the socket of the hip joint and it represents the junction between the three bones, ilium, ischium, and pubis. We also gave a name to this joint here, which is this one. Who remembers what we call that joint? Sacroiliac. Very, sacroiliac. Very good, sacroiliac joint, the joint between sacrum and ilium. Great. Then going down to the thigh, we have the bone of the thigh, which we call the femur. So we call this the head of femur, the neck of femur, greater trochanter, lesser trochanter, the shaft of femur. Distally, we call this the lateral condyle of femur and the medial condyle of femur. Anterior to the knee joint, there's a bone that we call the patella bone, which is that one. In the leg, we call the big bone the tibia and the smaller bone the fibula. Tibia and fibula. This is a lateral view, this is an AP view. Now, I want you to look at this radiograph and this radiograph, or maybe compare this one and that one, because they are both lateral views. Now, I want you to look at this region here. Seems to be there's a line there. This one here. These two are of the same individual, and this is a different individual. Look even down here, you see a line there a prominent one there, less prominent here. Why do you think these lines are here? And why do you think they're not in this one? Anyone? The presence of growth plates. Very good. So, yes. So it means that this person is not skeletally mature. This is still a young person. So that the growth plates have not yet fused but this one is skeletally mature. The growth plates have fused. Right. Great. Let me ask you a question there. It is popping on your screen. You should be having it now. Okay, vote on it. Right, we are good now. So majority have gotten it. When you talk of bones of the foot, we are referring to tarsal bones, metatarsal bones and phalanges. As we mentioned, there are a total of seven tarsal bones, the largest tarsal bone being calcaneus and the smaller, the, sorry, the calcaneus, the largest tarsal bone and the calcaneus, the one that forms the heel. The second largest tarsal bone is the talus 
the talus is the one that forms the joint between the talus and the bones of the leg, the ankle joint, which is also called the talocrural joint, the talus and the crura, talocrural joint. So talus forms the ankle joint, calcaneus forms the heel, then the others are there, yeah, in the midfoot. You remember that uh, we have a total of 14 phalanges in each foot. Now, we had talked about bones. And so I've just given you a summary of them again. Now, let's say something we didn't say before. Now, I want us to look at joints of the lower limb. Having talked about segments of the lower limb, as well as bones of the lower limb. The first joint I want us to talk about is the hip joint. The hip joint is a synovial joint of ball and socket variety, which means that the two bones are separated by a synovial cavity. The ball of the hip joint is formed by the head of the femur. The socket of the hip joint is formed by the acetabulum. So what type of movements will the hip joint allow? The hip joint allows movement in multiple planes. It will allow flexion and extension. It will allow adduction and abduction. It allows rotation. If a joint allows movement in multiple axes, then we describe that joint as being multi-axial. The hip joint is therefore a multi-axial joint, a joint that allows movement in multiple axes, multi-axial joints. So radiologically, this is how the hip joint will look like. This is the joint itself. This is the head of femur, that's the acetabular roof, neck, lesser trochanter, greater trochanter. The next joint we are going to talk about is the knee joint. The knee joint is a compound synovial joint. We agree that you call a joint compound if there are more than one bone, sorry, more than two bones involved. In the knee joint, there are three bones. So it qualifies to be called a compound joint. So what are the structures that articulate at the knee joint? We have the femoral condyles. These are the femoral condyles. This is the lateral femoral condyle and medial femoral condyle. We also have the tibial condyles. This is the, the lateral tibial condyle. This is the medial tibial condyle. I don't wonder why I know this is lateral, this is medial. You know, the fibula is usually on the lateral aspect. So when you see fibula, then you know that this side is lateral, this is medial. There's nothing magical about it. A condyle refers to the rounded end of a bone. So the femur has a rounded end. So we call them femoral condyles. Tibia as well has rounded ends. We call them tibial condyles. Lateral and medial tibial condyle. Lateral and medial femoral condyle. The other bone that form the knee joint is the patella, which is this one. So we see multiple bones forming the joint. And that's why we qualify to call it a compound joint. Now, when you look at the hip joint, the head of femur was fitting so nicely into the acetabulum. 
making the joint relatively stable even by looking. That does not really apply for the knee joint. When you look at those articulating surfaces, there is no congruency, so to speak. The bones are not congruent. They don't fit into each other nicely. And for that reason, the knee joint is therefore appear to be very unstable. And so it is actually, if you just look at the bony configuration. The bony configuration contributes less to the stability of the joint. For that reason, the knee joint has a number of strong ligaments that make the joint stable. Apart from strong ligaments, the knee joint also has some fibrocartilaginous structures within it that also tends to deepen the tibial articulating surface. The fibrocartilaginous structures in the knee are called menisci. So you have the medial meniscus and the lateral meniscus. These are articular discs. They are fibrocartilage in nature. So apart from the menisci, we also have ligaments. Now that does not mean that the hip joint did not have ligaments. It's sure it does have ligaments, but the stability of the hip joint is largely contributed by the anatomy of the articulating structures, the congruency of the articulation between the head of femur and the acetabular socket. However, the stability of the knee joint is largely attributed to the ligaments, not to the configuration of the bony surfaces. So which type of ligaments are there in the knee? Several of them, over 10 actually, but I'll only mention four. There are two ligaments which are on either side of the joint. They run from up down on either side of the joint. Because they're on either side, we call them collateral ligaments. So there is a medial collateral ligament and a lateral collateral ligament. The medial and the lateral collateral ligament primarily limit adduction and abduction movements. That is why we don't have adduction and abduction movements at the knee joint, because they are limited by the medial and the lateral collateral ligament. A question to you. The medial collateral ligament, which movement will it limit? Will it limit adduction? or will it limit abduction? So your choices are only those two, adduction or abduction. So I want a, a response and perhaps a reason as well. Anyone? I think abduction because it is medial to not allow the the like the side of the knee to move like upwards. Yeah. Okay, I agree with you. Thank you, Relin. So, medial collateral ligament limits abduction because in abduction, this is the side that will tend to widen. So that ligament will limit that widening. Remember, ligaments act by limiting stretch. So if you widen in abduction, this one goes that way. So this part will widen. That ligament will stop that widening. And similarly in adduction, this part widens. This ligament will limit adduction. This one will limit abduction. Apart from the collateral ligaments, 
we also have what we call the cruciate ligaments. The one I'm pointing at are cruciate ligaments. The cruciate ligaments run anterior to posterior within the joint. They are inside the joint. They are intra-articular. These ligaments are two. The anterior cruciate ligament and the posterior cruciate ligament. They limit anterior and posterior displacement of tibia. So anterior cruciate limits anterior displacement of tibia and posterior cruciate limits posterior displacement of tibia. Having said that, what movements are possible at the knee joint? The knee joint allows flexion and extension. You're able to flex your joint, knee joint, you're able to extend your knee joint. When your foot goes in front, you've extended the knee joint. When your leg goes backwards, almost to touch your thigh, that is flexion of the knee joint. So this is how the knee joint will look like. That is patella, this is the femur, the condyles of femur, these are the condyles of tibia. Or here, that's the patella, this is the lateral femoral condyle, medial femoral condyle, lateral tibial condyle, medial tibial condyle. This is the joint. That's of course fibula. Okay, the third joint we're going to talk about is the ankle joint. The ankle joint is also called the talocrural joint, the joint between talus and the crura which is the leg, talocrural joint. The ankle joint is a side of a joint, just like the other two large joints. But the variety is of what we call mortis and tenon joint. I forgot to tell you the variety for the knee joint. That was a hinge joint. For hip, we mentioned. For ankle, mortis and tenon type of joint. Now what's a mortis? A mortis is something that looks like this. This is the mortis. That is the shape of the mortis. So what forms the mortis? The distal part of tibia forms the mortis. The medial malleolus of tibia forms the mortis. The lateral malleolus of the fibula also forms the mortis. And what forms the tenon? The tenon is formed by this projecting part of the talus. That projecting part of the talus is what we call the trochlea of the talus. Trochlea of the talus. So the talus, the talus trochlea forms the tenon. The mortis is formed by the two malleoli as well as the distal aspect of the tibia. Right. So having said that that's the anatomy of the ankle joint, okay, maybe let me say something before we talk about movements. There are ligaments. The ankle also has collateral ligaments. There's a medial collateral ligament and lateral collateral ligaments on this joint. Okay, then that brings me to the question then. That question is projected on your pole. So please hurry up. Um, just take one minute only and I'll end it after one minute. So I'll tell you I'll end it after one minute and I'm ending it. So majority have gotten it right.
you need to realize that uh, adduction and abduction cannot occur where there is collateral ligaments. Now, inversion and eversion don't occur in the talocrural joint. We are going to see where they occur. So this is the ankle joint radiologically, or this one here. This is the mortis, and this is the tenon. The fourth joint we are going to talk about are the joints of the foot. So there's one that we call subtalar joint. It simply means the joint below talus. We also have what we call mid tarsal joint. It simply means the joint between, in the middle of the tarsal bones, this is the mid tarsal joint. You have talus and calcaneus proximally, and you have the rest of the tarsal bones distally. This is the mid tarsal joint, which is also called transverse tarsal joint. Then we have talocalcaneal navicular joint. This is the joint form between talus and calcaneus and cuboid. Talocalcaneal navicular joint. These are the joints of the foot. And in these joints, we have inversion and eversion. So this is the subtalar joint, basically. It's below talus. When you look at this joint between talus and the other bones, calcaneus navicular, so that whole complex is what you're calling talocalcaneal navicular joint. Good, we are done with the joints of the lower limb. Now I want us to look at muscle groups of the lower limb. We'll start with the muscles in the gluteal region. The muscles of the gluteal region are of two categories. We have three large gluteal muscles. It is not very important to remember their specific names, but this is what we call gluteus maximus. This is gluteus medius, and the one deep there is gluteus minimus. Maximus, medius, and minimus. Perhaps what is important for me is that you remember the action of these three muscles. Gluteus maximus is a powerful extensor of the hip joint. You use it when you are running or standing from a squatting position or climbing upstairs. It provides very strong hip extension. Gluteus medius and minimus are the principal abductors of the hip joint. They're the principal hip abductors. They're the ones that cause abduction of the hip primarily. Those are three large gluteal muscles. Then you have six other muscles which are small. But importantly, what do they do? They cause lateral rotation of the hip joint. So we call them the six small lateral rotators of the hip. There are six small muscles which cause lateral rotation of the hip joint. I don't want to give you their names. They're tiny, they're small, but they're here. Importantly, they cause lateral rotation of the hip. Down there, 
beyond the hip, the thigh, sorry, beyond the gluteal region, we go to the thigh. Now we talk about muscles of the thigh. Before we talk about muscles of the thigh, it is important to understand something about the, the compartments of the thigh. This is femur, which is the bone of the thigh. There's a thick fascia that goes around the whole thigh, therefore enclosing the muscles of the thigh. That thick fascia is called fascia lata. It's a thick fibrous fascia in the thigh that enclose the muscles of the thigh. This particular fascia sent in septae, three of them, that divided the thigh into three compartments. So one of those compartments would be this one, another one would be this one, and another one would be this one. Let's assume that the scepter here, one scepter runs there, another one here, and another one here. It will make us divide the thigh into three muscular compartments. So these muscular compartments can be named according to the anatomical location. There'll be the anterior compartment, posterior compartment, and medial compartment of the thigh. Let's begin with the posterior muscular compartment. The muscles of the posterior thigh are largely called the hamstring group of muscles. There are three muscles which constitute the hamstring group. Biceps femoris, semitendinosus because it's half a tendon, semimembranosus because it's half a membrane or partly a tendon, partly a membrane. Those three muscles are located in the back of the thigh. We call them the hamstring muscles. What do they do? With that strategic location, you can imagine if, the if there are muscles in the back of your thigh, what do they do to the knee joint? They will flex the knee joint. What will they do to the hip joint? They'll extend the hip joint. Because they flex the knee, we call the posterior compartment of the thigh, the muscles of the flexor compartment of the thigh. So the posterior compartment of the thigh is the flexor compartment of the thigh. The muscles of the flexor compartment receive a nerve supply from a nerve called tibial nerve. Tibial nerve is a branch of the sciatic nerve. The sciatic nerve is the largest nerve in the body. Tibial nerve is its largest branch. Tibial nerve is the one that supply muscles of the posterior thigh. Now we talk about anterior thigh. The muscles in front of your thigh are very many, but among those many muscles of the anterior thigh are what we call the quadriceps femoris unit. We mentioned how, why a muscle should be called quadriceps if it has four heads of origin. Femoris, it's located in the thigh. So quadriceps femoris unit is a complex of muscles with four heads of origin, which is located in the anterior thigh. Now, these are the four heads of origin. Vastus lateralis, vastus medialis, vastus intermedius, and rectus femoris. Four muscles which unite at the patella, as we can see here. And so through the patella, they exert the action on the tibia. If they all contract, they will cause 
extension of the knee joint. So muscles of the anterior thigh extend the knee, but they can also flex the thigh. Because they extend the knee, we call this muscular compartment the extensor compartment of the thigh. The muscles of the extensor compartment of the thigh are supplied by the femoral nerve. The last compartment of the thigh is the medial compartment of the thigh. The muscles of the medial compartment of the thigh will adduct the hip joint. They don't act on the knee, so they'll only act on the hip, they cause adduction. So we call this the adductor compartment of the thigh. These muscles are supplied by a nerve we are calling the obturator nerve. So those are the muscular compartments of the thigh. Now let's talk about muscular compartments of the leg. The leg has two big bones, tibia and fibula. There's a membrane that separates tibia and fibula. We call that interosseous membrane. The leg is covered by thick fascia, just like the thigh. Actually, the fascia of the leg is even thicker. This fascia is the one that encloses the muscles of the thigh, as demonstrated here. This fascia sends in septa, just like the fascia lata, to the fibula. The septa that it sends to the fibula separates the muscles of the leg into three compartments. This one here will be called the anterior compartment. This is the lateral compartment and this is the posterior compartment. Let's start with the anterior muscular compartment. The anterior muscular compartment of the leg simply refer to the muscles of the anterior leg. Now, if you have muscles in the anterior leg, what will they do? They'll cause the foot to go up, that's what we call in dorsiflexion. They'll also cause the toes to go up, and that's what we are calling extension of the toes. For that, those two reasons, we call the muscles of the anterior leg, the muscles of the anterior compartment of the leg. These muscles are supplied by a nerve, we are calling the deep peroneal nerve. Deep peroneal nerve is a branch of what we call the common peroneal nerve. And that common peroneal nerve is a branch of the sciatic nerve. So sciatic nerve gives you tibial nerve and common peroneal nerve. Common peroneal nerve then gives you deep and superficial peroneal. The deep peroneal nerve is in the anterior compartment. We talk about posterior compartment of the leg. Posterior compartment of the leg consists of muscles which are in the posterior leg. These muscles in the posterior leg, if they act, they'll cause plantar flexion. So we call them plantar flexors. Apart from plantar flexion, these muscles in the posterior leg also flex the knee joint because some of them cross the knee joint. And lastly, muscles of the posterior leg cause flexion of the toes because some of them are very long. They go to the toes to cause flexion. For the reasons understated here, we call the muscle of the posterior leg, the flexor compartment of the leg. The muscle of the flexor compartment of the leg receive innervation from the tibial nerve. They receive innervation from the tibial nerve. Remember, tibial nerve is a branch of sciatic nerve. 
Lastly, the muscles of the lateral compartment of the leg. Muscles of the lateral compartment of the leg, if they act, they'll cause a version of the foot. They simply evert the foot. We call muscles of the lateral compartment of the leg, muscles of the peroneal compartment. These muscles are supplied by the superficial peroneal nerve. Superficial peroneal nerve is a branch of the common peroneal nerve. All right. Let's talk about the arterial tree of the lower limb, then I'll give you a break. So I want to see how blood flows through the lower limb, but now the arteries for now. Remember that from the heart, there's a big artery that big artery is called the aorta. When the aorta reaches down in the abdomen, it divides into two, the right and the left common iliac arteries. So each common iliac artery goes to each side. Common iliac arteries are also because they divide into two types of arteries the external iliac and the internal iliac arteries. So in this image, we are seeing the common iliac artery dividing into two, the internal iliac and the external iliac artery. The internal iliac artery supply mass structures in the pelvic organ. The pelvic organs basically are supplied by branches of the internal iliac artery. The external iliac artery is the one that comes out from the ilium, that's why I call it external iliac. This external iliac artery is the one that when it reaches the thigh, it will be called the common femoral artery. So when it reaches the thigh, you call it common femoral artery. This is the common femoral artery. It divides into two. The superficial femoral artery and the deep femoral artery. The superficial femoral artery continues all the way to the leg. This is the superficial femoral artery, the straight one or that one. It continues straight to the leg. The deep femoral artery supply the muscles of the thigh. The other name given to the deep femoral artery is profunda femoris artery. So profunda femoris artery supply muscles of the leg through either direct or indirect branches. Now let's follow the superficial femoral artery. Superficial femoral artery, we've said it's a branch of common femoral artery and it's going straight to the leg. So usually it passes behind the knee joint and when it's passing behind the knee joint, we give it a different name. We call it the popliteal artery. The popliteal region is that region behind your knee. So the artery inside there is called the popliteal artery. Popliteal artery, once it has gone beyond the knee, the level of the knee, it divides into two. We have the anterior tibial artery and posterior tibial artery. The anterior tibial artery runs in front of the leg in the anterior compartment of the thigh. Posterior tibial artery runs behind the leg within the posterior compartment of the thigh. 
Now, if you follow that keenly, then you realize the, that the anterior tibial artery, the artery in front, that is the one that will go to the dorsum of the foot. So we call it the dorsalis pedis artery. The anterior tibial artery becomes dorsalis pedis artery beyond the ankle joint. Similarly, the posterior tibial artery becomes the medial and the lateral plantar arteries. There are two medial and lateral plantar arteries once they pass beyond the level of the ankle joint. Right. I want to stop there for now. And uh, give you a break. It's now 1030. Okay, maybe we can finish with the, the veins, then I give you a break so that we finish at 1040. This question here, write it down. You are not going to discuss it in this forum, but uh, you'll check on it. It is part of your assignment. You will not submit the assignment though. It will be something that uh, you'll just do on your own, but I'll ask you one day soon. So maybe let's spend the next five minutes to, to finish the veins. Then I give you a break after the veins. Let's talk about venous drainage of the lower limb. The veins of the lower limb are both superficial as well as deep. Superficial means that they're running on the skin. Deep means they're running with the muscles. The veins which run with the muscles are the ones you are called the deep venous system. The deep venous system follow arteries. And usually they will have the same names as those of the artery. So if there is a femoral artery, then there's a femoral vein. If there is a anterior tibial artery, then there is anterior tibial vein. That's the concept. Importantly, the veins of the lower limb form what you call vena comitante. Vena comitante is where you have two veins that run on either side of a single artery. The importance of that arrangement is so that the arteri arterial blood can warm the venous blood. Remember the limbs have come from the periphery, so they are cold, the blood is cold. The veins have come from the periphery, so the blood within them are cold. That's why you need a warming system for the venous blood. But the other reason why we have vena comitante is so that uh, the pulsations of the artery can be translated into the vein. So that will promote venous return. It is important for you to note that even though the deep veins follow arteries and they have the same names, the deep veins also receive superficial veins. Blood flows from superficial to deep venous system. Now we can talk about the superficial venous system of the lower limb. There are two key veins that constitute the superficial veins of the lower limb. The great saphenous vein and the small saphenous vein. The great saphenous vein runs on the medial aspect of the leg. Then it runs, sorry, it runs on the middle aspect of the foot. Then it runs on the middle aspect of the leg. And it goes all the way to the femoral vein. That means that it terminates way up in the thigh. 
as opposed to the small saphenous vein, which runs laterally and terminates into the popliteal vein. So we have the great saphenous vein and the small saphenous vein. What factors will promote venous return from the lower limb? The pumping activity of the heart is very important in promoting venous drainage from the lower limb. The fact that the heart is pumping creates some pressure in the arteries. That pressure in the arteries will drive blood in the veins back to the heart. Remember, blood in the lower limb struggles against gravity. And so the mechanisms we're talking about promote it promotes movement of blood in the veins of the heart, preventing backflow. The second mechanism that promotes venous drain of the lower limb is the presence of valves which allow flow only in one direction towards the heart. Also, the muscles of the lower limb usually contract the foot muscle of the foot can contract, the muscles of the calf can contract. The contraction of muscles promote venous return. We've talked about vena committante as the presence of two veins with one artery and that uh, this helps in wo warming the venous blood, but also importantly, the pulsations of the artery are translated into the vein and so that pulsation is a drive for venous return. Lastly, the movements of the thorax will create negative pressures within the thorax. Those negative pressures will tend to suck blood in the vena cava back to the heart. These are the mechanisms of venous in the lower limb. If these mechanisms go wrong, then what would be the problem? In terms of, okay, Maybe we're not starting with the problem, we're starting with the clinical utilities. We can use veins of the lower limb to fix intravenous lines. We use this often when there's a problem with the upper limb veins. Commonly, we don't prefer the lower limb veins because remember, lower limb is a bit dirty. But if there's no option, then we can use them. We also know where the great saphenous vein runs usually one finger breadth anterior and superior to the medial malleolus. That is where you always find it. Now, if we know that this vein is always here, then it means you can reliably use it to do some procedures. One of such procedures is where a patient comes to the hospital and they are really, really dehydrated until all the superficial veins have collapsed. What do you do when all the superficial veins are collapsed and you need to resuscitate this patient? A number of options you have. One is inject just water or fluid now into the intraosseous spaces, the bone marrow specifically. So that will require a big needle to just create a hole that enters bone marrow, then now you rehydrate from intraosseous line. Another one would be now what we call venous cutdown. In venous cutdown, you actually dissect by cutting the region that you expect that vein to be. Once you've seen the, ve the vein, then you identify the lumen and put fluids there. You are going to resuscitate that patient. In terms of clinical disorders associated with venous vein of the lower limb, we have what we call varicose veins and deep venous thrombosis. Deep venous thrombosis is the clotting of blood. So blood in the lower limb tends to clot because of slow movements, basically. Varicose veins are engorgement of superficial veins, as you can see here. This is varicose veins. Engorgement of superficial veins because of failure of the valves. Right, so now I'm done with 
venous drainage the lower limb. And that means I'm done with the vascular tree of the lower limb. We've looked at both arterial and venous drainage. So I will give you a break. Now we can take our tea break actually, which is usually 30 minutes. We are now going to talk about the nerves of the lower limb. There are a number of nerves you're going to highlight, but just to start, to start off, the nerves of the lower limb come from the lumbar plexus as well as the sacral plexus. The lumbar plexus will be the nerves from the lumbar segments of the spinal cord. The sacral plexus will be the nerves from the sacral segments of the spinal cord. A plexus is an intertwining of nerves without necessarily synapsing. So because they come from the lumbar plexus as well as the sacral plexus, we say that whole thing is called the lumbosacral plexus. And that's where the nerves of the lower limb come from. The lumbar nerves that will give you nerves that go to the lower limb will be L1, L2, L3, L4, and L5. The sacral nerves that give you nerves to the lower limb will be S1, S2, and S3 nerves. So that whole segment L1 to S5 nerves give you nerves to the lower limb. One of the largest nerves in the body which come from the lumbosacral plexus is the sciatic nerve. It will go to the lower limb. Apart from sciatic nerve, there's also what we call the femoral nerve so this one, this big one, would be the sciatic nerve, that one. This is the femoral nerve. And this other one is the obturator nerve. We will talk about those three. Let's begin with the sciatic nerve. So I've said this is the largest nerve in the body. The sciatic nerve comes out into the gluteal region from the pelvis. It appears into the gluteal region. And so this way it runs. It runs behind the hip bone, the hip joint, sorry. It runs behind the hip joint. Then it runs within the posterior compartment of the thigh. As it runs like that, it will give some branches as we can see. Even though sciatic nerve is a big nerve, they're actually considered to be two nerves within one big nerve. And so those two nerves separate ways as we approach the popliteal fossa, as we can see here. What are these two components? We have the tibial nerve, which is the one I'm pointing at right now. And you have the common peroneal nerve, which is this other one. So sciatic nerve represent two nerves within one big sheet. Those two nerves are the tibial nerve and the common peroneal nerve. We mentioned that the tibial nerve is the one that supplies the muscles of the posterior compartment of the thigh. We also mentioned that tibial nerve will supply the muscles of the posterior compartment of the leg. Common perineal nerve, which is this one, divides into two. 
there is a deep peroneal nerve which supplies muscles of the anterior compartment of the leg and superficial peroneal nerve which supplies muscles of the lateral compartment of the leg. So that summarizes that whole complex of sciatic nerve and its branches. As we do this, you need to ask yourself, so if I injure tibial nerve, then what happens? And this is largely based on what I've already told you about the distribution of those nerves and what those muscles actually do, the muscles that these nerves apply, what do they do? For example, I told you that uh, the deep peroneal nerve supply muscles of the anterior compartment of the leg. And I told you that the anterior compartment of the leg cause dorsiflexion. It therefore means that if I injure the deep peroneal nerve, I may paralyze the dorsiflexus. And if I paralyze the dorsiflexus, then I will lose dorsiflexion. So the foot will be in plantar flexion, what we call foot drop. You may not be familiar with the term foot drop though, but you should be able to work out the fact that if I injure the deep peroneal nerve or the common peroneal nerve, this particular patient may lose dorsiflexion. The foot will be in plantar flexion. Then now from a clinical point of view, I can now tell you that's what we call foot drop. But in terms of conceptualizing clinical symptoms that can happen following a nerve injury, we expect you to work out that. What you might not be able to do is to give it a correct terminology because that will require that you've read. But working out will require your reasoning. And in exam, I'll just test the reasoning part. So think through what will happen if I injure sciatic nerve, what I injure tibial nerve, if I injure superficial peroneal nerve, how will my patient present? Apart from the sciatic nerve and its major branches that we talked about, the second nerve in the lower limb is the femoral nerve. Fem femoral nerve is this one. It is running in front. This one supplies muscles of the anterior thigh. And lastly, we have another nerve on the middle aspect of the thigh, obturator nerve, which supplies muscles of the medial compartment of the thigh. So those are the nerves of the lower limb that I wanted to highlight to you. There are many other nerves in the lower limb, which I don't want to go into that big detail. Remember I told you for topographic approach, sorry, I told you that your approach is largely systemic, but from the topographic point of view, we just give an overview of a body region. Let's now finish with the anatomical spaces of the lower limb. The anatomical spaces we are going to talk about are about four. One of those anatomical spaces is the gluteal region. The gluteal region is an anatomical space, although it's a potential space. What are the boundaries of the gluteal region? These are the boundaries of the gluteal region before I go to the contents. So the superior boundary is this one. This is what we call the iliac crest. Okay, the landmark there is the iliac crest. The upper limit of the ilium, the upper border of the ilium is what we call the iliac crest. You can touch this one on yourself, even with clothes on. This is the iliac crest. The middle boundary is this one. That cleft there is what we call the natal cleft. That's the medial boundary of the gluteal region. The inferior boundary of the gluteal region is this one. This fold of the buttocks is what we call the gluteal fold or the gluteal crease. The lateral boundary of the gluteal region will be an imaginary line that joins the anterior aspect of the iliac crest 
to the greater trochanter. The greater trochanter is this projection here that you sometimes call the hip. This is the greater trochanter. So you join that to the imaginary line from the anterior end of the iliac crest. That anterior end of the iliac crest is what we call the anterior superior iliac spine. So from the anterior superior iliac spine to the greater trochanter, you get an imaginary line to establish the lateral boundary of the gluteal region. So this is the gluteal region. This is one, this is the other one. There are two gluteal hemispheres, as you know. What is contained within the gluteal region? There are muscles of the gluteal region. And I told you there are nine muscles, three large ones, six small ones. Apart from muscles, there are many other neurovascular structures. When I talk of neurovascular, it means nerves and blood vessels. So which nerves? I mentioned sciatic nerve. Femoral and obturator are not in the gluteal region, but sciatic nerve is in the gluteal region. Apart from sciatic nerve, there are other nerves which supply the other muscles of the gluteal region. I really don't want to go into their specific names. We can leave them there. The neurovascular structures are in the gluteal region. How is the gluteal region clinically important? We commonly use gluteal region for intramuscular injections. Now, listen to this. Why, we, why should we use gluteal region for intramuscular injections? Anyone? Why is it a preferred site for intramuscular injection? Nobody wants to try? Okay. We use the gluteal region for intramuscular injections because there's enough muscle bulk. The muscles of the gluteal region are bulky. So it means even if you poke someone with a needle, the risk of that needle reaching bone is low is enough muscle bulk. That is why it's a preferred site for intramuscular injection. The other preferred site for intramuscular injection is this region of your shoulder, which we call the deltoid region. Now, the other question is, when you want to give intramuscular injections, then where do we give the intramuscular injections? Now you'll be told, you divide the gluteal region into four. Now those four, uh, which are equal patient, it's imaginary. So let's use this left gluteal hemisphere. So you put this one like this and that like that. So you divide it into four quadrants, upper outer quadrant, upper inner quadrant, lower inner quadrant, lower outer quadrant. The preferred site, the recommended site for putting the injection is upper outer quadrant. So the needle is inserted through the upper outer quadrant. Now, my second question to you is, we've already agreed that gluteal region has good muscle bulk, and that is why it is preferred when you want to give intramuscular injection. Now, my question to you is this, why should we use the upper outer quadrant and maybe not the lower inner quadrant to give these injections? Anyone? Okay, seems like either you're not in class or you have no idea. Okay, now the reason is this. I've mentioned to you that there are several neurovascular structures in the gluteal region. Sciatic nerve is just one of them, but there are many others. Those many other structures run in this region here. 
So the upper outer quadrant of the glute region is the one that is devoid of the major neurovascular structures. That means that that needle, when you insert it in the upper outer quadrant, you are unlikely to cause trauma to any of these neurovascular structures we are talking about. But if you are to give that injection in the lower inner quadrant, in as much as there's even more muscle bulk, there is a high risk of injuring the neurovascular structures. And what will be the end result? If you injure a nerve, you're going to get a nerve injury, you can paralyze that person for life. You've heard of cases, I'm sure, of where someone got an injection and got paralyzed, commonly in children. That paralysis can be for life. You will have crippled someone for the rest of their life. So that's why it is important to understand the anatomy. You don't just poke because injections are given. You must know what is where. And that's actually basically the relevance of topographic anatomy. You know what is where. So for gluteal region, remember, it's a good site for giving it a muscle injection. Why? Because there's enough muscle bulk. So there's a good space for the needle. But where exactly in the gluteal region? Upper outer quadrant. Reason, that is a region that is not having the major neurovascular structures. Beyond the gluteal region, the second anatomical space we want us to talk about is the femoral triangle. The femoral triangle is a triangular space, as the name suggests. Now, this triangular space is in the proximal part of the anteromedial thigh. Now, understand that term. Proximal means on the upper part of the thigh. Anteromedial thigh means anterior and medial thigh. This region here is what we are calling the femoral triangle, that triangle there. So what are the boundaries of this triangle? Just like any other triangle, we'll expect three boundaries. The lateral boundary of the femoral triangle is formed by this muscle here. This is the longest muscle in the body. We call it sartorius muscle. We call it sartorius to allude to the fact that, uh, okay, the tailors, the sartorius refer to the tailors. This is the muscle that the tailor uses when they are tailoring. It brings the lower limb into that position that a tailor takes where the, the lower limb is flexed, the hip is slightly abducted and laterally rotated. Then the knee joints are flexed. And that's exactly what sartorius muscle does. This is the lateral boundary of the femoral tongue. This is the middle bound of the femoral triangle. The muscle forming the middle bound of the femoral triangle is called the adductor longus. Sorry, this is not adductor longus, this is the adductor longus, this one here. That's the adductor longus muscle. Excuse me, sir. I think my, the, 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 your cursor is not moving. I don't know if it's on mine alone or others too. Okay, let me try the one without the, Okay, do you see the one, the white one now? Is it moving? Not, right yet. Not yet. I don't know if it's mine alone. I, don't know alone. I, I think maybe it's on your side. Okay, okay. So the others can see it moving. All right, let's go on. So this is Sartorius, this long muscle here, the lateral boundary of the femoral triangle. Then this one here is the adductor longus muscle. Adductor longus muscle forms the medial boundary of the triangle. 
Now you know why that muscle is called adductor longus. It adducts and it's a long muscle. These are adductor longus. Then this is the base of the triangle. The base of the triangle is formed by a ligament. And that ligament is called the inguinal ligament. Great, so this is the femoral triangle, that region here. What are the contents of the femoral triangle? The femoral triangle contains the femoral artery, the femoral vein, femoral nerve, some lymph nodes, and the lymph nodes in the femoral triangle are called inguinal lymph nodes. Those are the major contents of the femoral triangle. Femoral artery, femoral vein, femoral nerve, and inguinal lymph nodes, the lymph nodes in the femoral triangle. So what's the clinical relevance of the femoral triangle? I'll teach you a few. I'd clarify to you what the term clinical relevance means that you look at it in two aspects. One is how do we use the anatomy there to understand a particular abnormality? The other one is how do you use the anatomy there to clinically intervene? And you've seen the gluteal region, the fact that the anatomy, the mass of the gluteal region are bulky, that's the anatomical knowledge, we can utilize that information by giving injections. So we've used the anatomy of the gluteal region to clinically intervene. But also, suppose a child receives an injection in the gluteal region, then this child is unable to walk thereafter. How do we explain that one? We can still use the anatomy of the gluteal region to explain that pathology, that most likely the sciatic nerve was injured. So in the same scenario here in the femoral triangle, what's the clinical relevance? I will teach you clinical relevance largely based on maybe clinical intervention as well, as well as maybe based on understanding a pathology. So let's start with the clinical intervention. Sometimes <clears throat> a patient might come to the hospital and you're supposed to withdraw blood from them. You try the veins of the upper limb they're all collapsed. What are your options? One of the next options you have for withdrawing blood is withdrawing blood from the femoral vein. Now, how do you know this is the femoral vein? You know, the patient comes and they're covered and they have clothes on. How do you know this is the vein? So we use a landmark. If you look at this, you'll note that the femoral artery is slightly just lateral to the femoral vein. So when you come, the patient, of course, the clothes are not over this region at that time. You put your finger here and you'll feel the pulsations of the artery. The moment you feel the pulsation of the artery, then you know that's where the artery is. So if you want to get the vein, you put the needle slightly medial to that pulsation you'll get the venous blood. Of course, you put the needle with the syringe with the negative pressure as you go in. The moment the needle is through the vein, you will be able to withdraw the venous blood from there. Remember, it's blind, but you'll have to do it. And you'll be doing it a lot of times when you can't withdraw blood from the veins of the upper limb for one reason or another. Maybe you've tried, you've poked the person too much, or they've gotten burned, so you cannot really use those veins. These are your options. So remember, the vein is medial to the artery. If you do a mistake of palpating, you feel the artery, then you inject lateral quisha because you'll injure the femoral nerve. That person will get paralyzed. You'll be sued. So remember the anatomy. Okay. That is in terms of intervention. In terms of understanding pathology, sometimes you may have some swellings over the femoral triangle. And I think all of us, if I'm not wrong, 
may have had a scenario where there was something swollen over this femoral tongue. The common causes of swelling in the femoral tongue are these ones, the inguinal lymph nodes. The inguinal lymph nodes are the commonest causes of swellings in the femoral tongue. Why do lymph nodes swell? Lymph nodes swell if there is an infection. Perhaps you are playing and you knocked your big toe on the ground some two days earlier. There's an infection that's trickling in, get arrested in the lymph nodes there. The lymph nodes will react by swelling. Depending on different cultures you come from, you may have to manage that in different ways. But of course, remember from a scientific point of view, this is inflammation of lymph nodes because there's an infection in the lower limb. So generally, the inguinal lymph nodes here will swell if there is an infection in the lower limb. They may also swell if there's an infection in the external genitalia because they still drain the lymphatics from the external genitalia. Right. Closely related to femoral tango is what we call the femoral sheath. Now, what is femoral sheath? Femoral sheath is a common sheath that contains the femoral vessels. This fibrous tissue here, this white tish, fibrous tissue that is contained the femoral vessels. Now here we are using an image from the left side. The previous one, we're using an image from the right side. Don't confuse them. So this is the medial aspect. This is the lateral aspect. You can see the sartorius is there. So this whitish thing drawn here is what you're calling the femoral sheath. It's a common sheath that contains the femoral vessels. Now, I want you to understand the femoral sheath as a loose cloth. Maybe it's a dera or okay, a dress, but a very loose dress. So that means that uh, it will contain the femoral vessels, yes, but there'll be still some space within that particular sheet. The same way if you wear a very loose dress, you'll be inside that dress, but there'll be still some space that someone else can hide inside in a light knot. So having said that, the femoral sheet contain femoral vessels but there is still some loose space on the middle aspect of it. That loose space on the middle aspect of it is called the femoral canal. This femoral canal is a potential space that connects the abdominal cavity to the thigh. It's a potential space extending from the abdominal cavity to the thigh the same way the femoral vessels are coming from the abdominal cavity. So this is what I mean. This is the sheet. These are the femoral vessels. And this is the femoral canal, that potential space on the middle aspect of the femoral sheet. This potential space connect the abdominal cavity to the thigh. So what's the clinical importance of that? The clinical importance of the femoral canal is this, that if you cough or you strain a lot, you may actually increase the chances of abdominal organs going through that space to the thigh. Now that sounds scary, but it's not that often um, it doesn't happen many times. It can happen in few people. There are reasons why it happens. So you must have some predispositions. But they, theoretically, if there is raised inter-abdominal pressure, some abdominal organs can actually go through that space, pop through that femoral canal to the thigh. And that's what we call femoral hernia. Hernia, H, E-R-N-I-A 
is where you have protrusion of an organ through a defect. If an organ protrudes through a defect, we say that organ has herniated. So in this case, the organs that usually are near are abdominal organs. If they are near through the femoral canal, then you call that femoral hernia. You people must have seen some people with very prominent umbilicus, very big umbilicus. The navel, I mean, is the umbilicus. Now, that very prominent umbilicus is not necessarily beauty. It's actually a pathology. Now, that one will be called umbilical hernia because abdominal organs are popping through a defect in the navel. And that's why you have that very prominent thing. And you realize for those people when they cough or laugh, that thing actually becomes even more prominent. You'll think it's going to bust. Then when they're lying supine, with, maybe with the abdomen relaxed, you can actually reduce that hernia. It can even form a cup now on the inside. So basically, a hernia is when you have protrusion of organs through a defect. Femoral hernia is when you have protrusion of abdominal organs through the femoral canal. Now, in as much as I'm calling them abdominal organs, don't start thinking of those big abdominal organs like the liver, the spleen, the kidney, not necessarily those ones. In most cases, the organs that actually protrude could just be fat tissue within the abdominal cavity. But in addition to that, sometimes you may have intestines. Other than fat, you may have intestines. So when intestines go through there, now that could be a bit troublesome because it means that you can block the intestines. But most cases, it will just be fat. So it will be painful, but it's OK. The people manage them. Some people live with hernia for the rest of their life. It may not be a big deal. So the issue is when maybe it causes complications. Intestines went through and have refused to go back. Now it becomes a surgical emergency. Right. So that's the spelling of hernia. Also, apart from the femoral sheath being a site of femoral herniation, specifically through the femoral hernia, we've already talked about uh, the fact that you can get pulsations of the femoral artery and so be able to withdraw blood from the femoral vein. Apart from that, you can also actually just access the femoral artery when you're doing a procedure, there's some procedures that require that you insert something in the femoral artery. Let's say you want to do a study, a radiological study, which we call angiogram studies. You want to in inject a drug within the blood vessels so that now you image the patient. That's what we call angiography. When you want to do such studies, you will have to in inject that drug through femoral artery, okay, not the drug, but the, the, the instrument you're inserting first. You insert instruments through the artery and you take that instrument. They could be just a very long wire, like two meter long wire. You're inserting it through the person all the way to the vessel of interest. Maybe you want that vessel to be a vessel in the brain. So insert a wire, you can imagine, all the way from the femoral artery goes to the common femoral, uh, the common iliac artery goes to the aorta, goes to the branches of the aorta, all the way to the brain, because we want to study something there. So usually we use femoral artery as an access point when we're doing those kind of studies. The last anatomical space in the lower limb that I want to talk about is the popliteal fossa. So what is popliteal fossa? The popliteal fossa is a diamond shaped space behind the knee joint. This is the diamond. It's a diamond shaped space behind the knee joint. So what are the boundaries of this diamond shaped space? 
The superior boundaries are these ones. We have the muscles of the posterior thigh. Those muscles of the posterior thigh are these ones. We talked of them, the hamstring muscles, basically. So we have biceps femoris, we have semitendinosus and semimembranosus. Those are the superior boundaries. How about the inferior boundaries? The inferior boundaries, you have these muscles of the posterior leg. One of those muscles of the posterior leg are the gastrocnemius. The gastrocnemius are the ones we call masquembe. So this masquembe here, they're usually the medial and the lateral gastrocnemius. They're the ones that form the inferior boundary. So you have a diamond here. This diamond is what we're talking about. What are the contents of this diamond? This diamond space contains popliteal vessels, which means there's a popliteal artery, there's a popliteal vein. There's also branch of the sciatic nerve. Those two terminal branches of the sciatic nerve, you remember them. The tibial nerve and the common peroneal nerve. Now remember, I'm not saying sciatic nerve is inside the popliteal fossa because that's not true. The true statement is that the branches of the sciatic nerve are the ones within the popliteal fossa. And which branches? The tibial branch, as well as the common peroneal branch. In addition to those neurovascular structures, we also have lymph nodes. The lymph nodes in the popliteal fossa are just called popliteal lymph nodes. These lymph nodes drain still the lower limb, but specifically the leg. They will not drain the whole lower limb definitely because they're just at the level of the knee. They drain the lateral aspect of the leg and the foot. The lymph nodes in the popliteal fossa, they drain the lymph which come from the lateral aspect of the foot, as well as the lymph which come from the lateral aspect of the leg. So that means that uh, from a clinical point of view, if you are to injure the small toe, then the lymph nodes that you'll expect to swell are not necessarily the inguinal lymph nodes, but the popliteal lymph nodes. However, if you injure the big toe, you will not expect the popliteal lymph nodes to swell. You will expect the inguinal lymph nodes to be the ones swelling because the popliteal lymph nodes just drain the lateral aspect of the foot and the lateral aspect of the leg. Lastly, popliteal fossa also contain adipose tissue, fat. So in terms of clinical relevance, I've told you that you can have swellings in the popliteal fossa. If you have swellings in the popliteal fossa, it could be due to enlargement of popliteal lymph nodes. And the common reason would be that uh, you have injury somewhere in the lateral foot or lateral leg, and so there's an infection tracking up. It will be attacked at the popliteal lymph nodes. Apart from swelling of lymph nodes, you may also have other swellings in the popliteal fossa. And a common cause of swelling also in the popliteal fossa will be swelling from the synovial membrane of the knee joint. Sometimes it might pop through this region. And you'll be seeing that even more often in adults, swelling from the synovial membrane of the knee joint. Right. I want to give you an assignment. This is the assignment that you're going to do. I want you to write it down. Okay, you can take a screenshot. So you are going to read on development of the limbs. And specifically, you're going to read on the embryonic origins of the limbs, where do the limbs come from. You're also going to read on the differences between the development of the upper limb when you compare that with development of the lower limb. 
And lastly, you are going to name five common congenital malformations of the limbs. And for each congenital malformation you're going to talk about, you'll say the mechanism. How does it happen? So pick a congenital malformation that you are able to explain the mechanism. You don't just pick any congenital malformation. Otherwise, you live in have over 30. Just pick the ones you're able to explain the embryological basis. Great. So that's it for lower limb anatomy. Let me see what time we have. Okay, it's already noon, so I'll not start this one. We will do anatomy of the upper limb uh, next week. Or we, are we meeting on Friday? Let me check. Uh, 